Our scripture this morning will be from the book of 2 Corinthians, and we'll turn to the 5th chapter, and we'll do verses 6 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Therefore we are always confident to know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Good morning, church. Good to see everyone this morning. It looks like we have a lot back from uh, our Memorial Day uh, vacations, festivities, or whatever it may be. I know several were out of town, so I see a lot of you back. And it's always good. Uh, it's always good to be back. I know it's always good to be back home after you've after you've been away. Uh, regardless, I do want to make one uh, quick clarification uh, before we go any further. Um, with Gloria, I believe um, it is better to visit her earlier in the day. Is that still correct, Debbie and Dan? Uh, visit her earlier in the day um, just because at night it's not as good. So if you can do that and if, uh, if you work uh, during the week, uh, maybe make it a point to, to go see her on a Saturday or, or a Sunday uh, when, uh, when that's more available for you. So. So let's make sure that we do that as well. Uh, this morning, we are going to be uh, starting just a, a short series of, of lessons on uh, Christ and culture. And I've entitled the lesson this morning, uh, Christ, Culture, and Spirituality, or Thinking Spiritually. You know, I think it's, I think it's quite obvious that we live in a world that does not very often think spiritually. And I want you to think about some aspects of your life on why you do what you do. Just why you do what you do every single day of your life. Why do you dress the way that you dress? Do you dress the way that you dress to because it's what you like, because it's the most comfortable thing, or because it's what the world is wearing, and you want to be an impressive part of the world. Why do you talk the way that you talk? Is it because you know it's the right thing to do or the, the right things to say, or is it because it's what everybody says? It's what you're around all the time when you're at work. Why do we go? Why do you go to the places that you go? Is it because that's where society tells you to go? It's what society tells you to do. Is it because it's what you think is right and okay? Is it because... It's where everyone else is going. You know, we have a number of reasons probably of why we do what we do, why we say what we say, why we wear what we wear. All of the many aspects of our life versus culture. There's probably a lot of different reasons for that. But I would also venture to say that a big reason why we do what we do in this world is because a majority of the world is telling us to do it. Even when it comes to what we believe. And that is where the culture war between our culture and Christ and our faith or our spirituality comes head to head. Because there's so much of this world 
that has really a false identity in Christ, isn't there? There is a false identity in Christ out there where the world gives you this over-medicated version, I guess you might call it, this, this, this dumbed-down version or this sugar-coated version of what it takes to be a Christian or what you need to be as a Christian. And it makes the idea of Christianity to be very, very vague because there's so much of culture and current culture mixed in to it. And so this morning, what I want us to think about as the things that we do, the things that we say, the clothes that we wear, the places that we go, the people that we hang out with or interact with, those things usually define our existence. Where do those things fall when it comes to our existence in this world as a child of God? And by the way, I do personally want to congratulate Eric on his decision yesterday on becoming a Christian. You know, when we are babes in Christ, we're very much at a learning point in our Christian faith and our Christian life. And of course, I think we all are at a learning point. We're all still learning and we're all still growing. But we have a lot of things that we face when it comes to what culture throws at us. And it's interesting, you know, nowadays I see a lot of culture or society trying to tell Christians how they're supposed to act, what they're supposed to be like, what they're supposed to accept as being okay. And we're falling for that in droves. So this morning, I want us to think about, you know, we've already talked about, you know, practicing the truth and, and living the truth in love, sharing the truth in love. But let's incorporate that with what we talk about this morning when we think about Christ culture and spirituality. And my first point this morning, or the first thought that I want to go, to, go into is this. Spiritual people need to take a step back from culture. Wouldn't you agree? And I, by the way, I hope I don't lose the PowerPoint. I've had to juggle between a couple of different uh, computers uh, to get this up here. So I apologize if we do lose it. Spiritual people need to take a step back from culture. What do I mean by that? First of all, here's what the world's telling us. The world tells you to embrace everything in culture, don't they? We are told to embrace everything. Everything that maybe a majority of people in the United States, a majority of the, the people in the world, begin to accept. We are told that we need to embrace that thing. And it comes along with a couple of ideas like this. Whatever feels right to you is right. If it feels okay, if you feel like you're not hurting anybody by doing what you're doing, if, and sometimes we look at it this way, well, the only person that I'm hurting is myself, and so it's nobody else's concern. Whatever feels right is right. <coughs> well, folks, there's been a lot of times in my own life where I've done something because I felt like it was the right thing, but it sure wasn't. And in doing that thing, I've hurt people. In doing that thing, I've hurt myself. In doing that thing, I've hurt my own faith. In doing that thing, I've caused myself to struggle in many ways. Just because something feels right doesn't make it right. You know what that is? That is an earthly pleasure. That's all that is. That is a self-desire that's being fulfilled. Whatever feels right is right. And we also live in a world where cultural relevance transcends the law of God. How many people do we know today in our world that look at the Bible and say, a book that was written 
2,000 or more years ago is no longer relevant. That book was written when people just didn't know anything, when people didn't understand anything, when people tried to explain everything in science with God. Folks, those are people, too, that don't realize the treasure of science that's even in the Bible itself. It's so cool whenever you see all of those different nuggets. But they look at the Bible as something that is completely irrelevant. And I want us to, first of all, think about a passage that, where Paul is reminding his readers, and we're going to take a lot from 2 Corinthians chapters 4 and 5 this morning, because that is where Paul is addressing the Corinthian church about the culture war that that church is in the middle of, the things that they're facing every single day. Remember that Corinth was one of those places that was knee-deep in idol worship. It was knee-deep in both Greek and Roman culture. It was knee-deep in a society that was very accepting of many different sinful behaviors. In many ways, the city of Corinth was no different than what you and I experience every single day. But take a look at what Paul says here in chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. He says, So we don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Isn't it interesting here that basically what Paul is doing and what Paul is saying to the people at Corinth is it's time to put a different set of glasses on your face. You've been looking at this world through a pair of glasses that show you what you want to see. That show you what you want to see. But it does not show you a complete picture. It doesn't show you everything that is there. All you can see through the glasses that you're looking at through the world is the world, is worldly things. You can't see anything past that. You can't see anything beyond that. You can't see the fact that you were created in, in the image of God and that you are not just this earthly body, that you are not just this earthly flesh, but you are something more which makes you even more valuable. You are a spirit, and that spirit is eternal. And that spirit, being eternal, can have an eternal home. Stop looking. Stop looking through this, these momentary glasses that just show a small inkling of your existence. I think that this, this passage can very much so apply to ideas or beliefs. You know, a lot of times, and in most cases, the thinking of the people of this world is based on here and now. And when it is based on here and now, it's based on fulfilling your desires right here and now. And Paul's trying to tell the readers here that we constantly need to be renewed. Now, this is not a renewal of, okay, folks, what God wants you to understand is that since culture is constantly changing, you constantly need to change with culture and so do your beliefs. That's not what Paul is saying. He's saying the complete opposite. He's saying you need constant renewal within your faith. And part of that constant renewal is making sure that you are constantly
constantly filling your mind with what God wants in your life, not with what the world wants in your life. You need spiritual renewal, not cultural. Take a look at 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 2. So that's backing it up several verses. <coughs> As we think about spiritual renewal and what that means, and what Paul and the Corinthians had to do whenever they accepted Christ, whenever they began to live for him, here's a good example of what that means. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We've refused to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. See what he's saying, what he's saying there? He's saying, we're going to den denounce the things that are disgraceful, and we're constantly going to do that. We're not going to tamper with the word of God, ever. We're not going to mess with it. Because that's not the will of God. And that's not living for Christ. That is living for culture. And we can't do that. You know, 1 Peter, excuse me, I want to go to Romans 12 and verse 2, where Paul tells the Romans there, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is what? The will of the people? The will of the world? What your personal will is? No. That you may determine what is the will of God. You're to be transformed, meaning you're to look different than the world. You're not supposed to look the exact same as culture. I understand that we live in a world that we like to enjoy things. Um, we, we like to do things in this world. We, we like to experience God's creation. There's nothing wrong with that. But when those things take precedent over living strictly for the Lord, that's where we have a problem. 1 Peter 1 and verse 23 tells us that rebirth, that our rebirth, happens by living and abiding in the Word of God. If we're constantly renewing ourselves, if we're constantly renewing our minds, then the Word of God needs to be the source of that renewal. We don't get it from somebody else telling us what the Bible says when we can look at the Bible and see that what they're saying is a complete contradiction of it. We don't get that renewal. We don't get that rebirth. With the entertainment business telling us how we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to act. You know, this, this kind of reminds me a little bit of a side note, but I think a lot of us have kind of been seeing what's happened, uh, been happening in the news. And, you know, as different states are deciding to, uh, because of what happened in New York and what is now happening in Illinois, that got a lot of more conservative states a little bit frightened about how far people are willing to take abortion. How late in a pregnancy that that's, that's allowed to happen. So a lot of states have started jumping in with these laws that many, many Christians have really wanted all along to protect the unborn. What does the entertainment business think about that? They don't like it. You look at places like the state of Georgia. What are they doing? Hollywood has a big foot in the state of Georgia. A lot of your favorite shows are filmed now in that state around the Atlanta area. I remember going on a mission trip there uh, with teenagers 
and there were two or three projects going on within the Atlanta area at that time. So there were big time celebrities there and all that kind of stuff. Well, you see, those people in the entertainment business, they're not citizens of Georgia. But they bring a lot of money in there. So when they don't like a decision that's made, what do they do? They threaten the state. And they say, well, we don't like this decision, so we're pulling out of here. We're going to take your money until you change your mind. Now, folks, that's on a political level. And I don't like to get political from the pulpit, but I do think that the issue that I just brought up is more of a moral issue than it is political. And so I'll stand by that one all day long. But folks, this is, this is happening every single day. This is happening every single day just in our personal lives. Where all over the place, the regular fan of entertainment is being belittled and downplayed if you don't believe the same things. If you're not as open-minded as these people that are in the entertainment business that, by the way, their job is to lie for a living. Their job is to be somebody that they're not every single day. And that's not what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to show people exactly who we are every single day. We're supposed to show people that we belong to Christ. And we need spiritual renewal. You can't find that in the entertainment business. You find that in God's Word. Secondly, this morning, we need to understand this. Spiritual people should live in tents. Now, am I up here telling you that you need to go sell your house right now, go buy a tent and find a campsite and live there the rest of your life? Absolutely not. But what do I mean by this spiritually? Spiritual people should live in tents. Folks, this is how you should look at the world. This world is not my home. When this world does become your home, that's when you begin to accept everything. That's when you begin to be okay with everything. But that's not the way that God would have it. Philippians 3 and verse 20 tells us that our true citizenship is is in heaven. And I don't want to skip the idea, you know, when we say this world is not your home, I, I bet most of you probably automatically think about the song, don't you? This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. What does the rest of that say? My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. My treasures aren't here. Nothing down here is anything I'm going to take with me. Therefore, what I am going to take with me into eternity is my faith. What I am going to take with me in eternity is what I believe and what I have done as a result of that faith and what I have done as a result of that belief. That's what's going to be important. We've got to understand this world is not your home. We're sojourners. We are sojourners in this world. We are just travelers. We're not here to stay. We're not here to make an eternal home. And I find it interesting what Peter basically calls the Christian in verse 1 of chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Peter calls the readers elect exiles. We are exiles from this world. When you decided to become a child of God, then you basically exiled yourself from earthly or worldly citizenship. And you did it by your decision. You said, I don't want to be identified as this anymore. I don't want to be identified as worldly. I don't want to be identified as a self-worshipper. I don't want to be identified as someone that just does for him or herself. I'm a citizen of heaven. Christ is my king. God is my Lord. And that is who my allegiance is to and always will be to. 
Now go to 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. He says, actually, I think that's 1 Peter 2 and verse 11 uh, that I'm looking at. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. As sojourners and exiles, abstain from the passions of the flesh. Don't be involved in those things. Those things are what are waging war against your soul. And we don't think about it that way because whenever we do those things, we're among people that enjoy those things as well, that want to do the same things. And so we, we find ourselves in a kinship. We, we find ourselves among friends. Yet we become blind sometimes that the things that we're doing is almost committing treason against God in this, in this war. We've stepped over to the other side and said, oh, I'm having a little bit of trouble. I can't decide which side I want to be on. You know what that reminds me of? I don't know how many of you have studied World War II, but the eastern front of World War II is very, very interesting. You all realize that hardly any, there was hardly any issue with Americans going over to the German side during World War II. There were some loyal German U.S. citizens that before you, the U.S. got involved went over to help fight for the motherland, but that number was few and far between. Few and far between. I don't have a statistic, but if we were to see the statistic on how many Russians went over to the German side during World War II, it would be mind-blowing. As a matter of fact, whenever you watch the movie, which not all of it's accurate, but whenever you watch the movie Any Enemy at the Gates, they kind of highlight that issue where Germans would say over the enemy lines, they would say, hey, come over to our side. You'll get three square meals a day. You'll get your own shoes to wear. You don't have to take them off of a dead man, and you'll get your own rifle which, by the way, they would oftentimes have to share a rifle with two or three other soldiers. They would be sent, especially in the Battle of Stalingrad, one rifle would go into battle with three soldiers, and when that soldier with the rifle dropped, another one would pick it up, and that second guy would have to wait for that guy to drop before he had any way to defend himself. Can you imagine how appealing that would be to those men to go over to a side? where they got all their own equipment and they got taken care of with three meals a day and all that kind of stuff. Well, folks, I think that sometimes we're tempted in that same way because we're told all of these promises. We're given all these promises by the world about how we're going to be satisfied, how we are going to be fulfilled. Yet think about it. Whenever we are involved in sin, how empty do we end up feeling? when it's all said and done. Sin and the pleasures of this world leave us empty. And in many cases, too, whenever we get caught up in sin, when we get caught up in addictions and things like that, that sin always leaves us wanting more. We're never satisfied. We're never, ever satisfied with the pleasures of this world. We always want more. More. Second Corinthians 5 4, which is part of you know our main text that I, I mentioned, says, For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up in life. Paul makes it a point to say, We are in an earthly tent. In that earthly tent, sometimes we, we struggle. It's not the most comfortable lifestyle. Uh, the worst camping experiences I've ever had is camping in late July or early August. Why? Because even at night, it stays pretty hot. I want that air conditioning. Bad. Really bad. It's not desirable, but it's only for a time. And that's what... Paul's saying it's only for a time that we live in these tents and one day we will have a mansion. We as Christians need to live 
in spiritual tense. Thirdly and lastly this morning, spiritual people should value temporal life. We're told that this life is just a vapor. We're told that this life is not long compared to eternity. But the life that you live is of the utmost importance and it's so valuable. Our physical life, first of all, should consist of spiritual living. Our physical life should consist of personal spiritual living. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Don't walk according to the flesh. Don't walk according to what you see and hear in this world and what the world tells you to do. But walk by faith, knowing that we're given some promises here of things that we cannot see. But these promises are greater than anything we could ever imagine on this earth. And they're not false promises like the world tries to give each and every one of us. We've got to walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We are all going to give an account for the way in which we live our physical lives. Are we living our physical lives with a spiritual mindset? Are we focused on God more than we are focused on on this world. That's where God wants us to be. But also, also folks, our physical life, we need to understand that our physical life can produce spiritual lives. The physical life that we live on this earth can help to produce spiritual lives in others. Just think about that for a moment. Look at verses 8 through 12. And I'm not going to read that word for word. But here Paul lists all the things that he and other disciples had endured. So that other people could see Christ in them. Paul and these other disciples, these others that went along with him, gave up so many pleasures. So many desires in their life. They sacrificed so much so that so much of the world could hear the truth of the gospel. So that so much of the world could have the opportunity to be saved. And we have that same opportunity. Verse 15, he lets the readers know that he did all of this for their sake. He did it for them. He did it. Because he knew that they could enjoy the same eternity that he would one day enjoy as well. You know, whenever you go to 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 16, Paul there tells them, you know, imitate me. Be, imi be imitators of me. And he would say in other places, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Imitate me as, as I live spiritually. And that's, that's what we need to be too. We need to be people that others can imitate. There's a lot of people in this world that are visual learners. We've always heard that phrase that you might be the first Bible that they ever see. And I think that's true. I hope it's not the only Bible that they ever see. I hope that they can actually open up the world, word and by looking at you, they ask questions and say, I need to know more about this. I don't understand why this person is living the way that they are. Why are they so selfless? Why are they living so self-sacrificially? Why are they focused on living for God and not for them, themselves? Why aren't they just enjoying life, doing whatever they want to do? What is it that they see that is so much greater? We can help people start to ask those questions, and maybe we can even help them answer those questions. Hopefully we can live lives that other people can imitate. Folks, basically what I want us to get out of this this morning is that we need to keep spiritual things the main focus <coughs> in our lives. If we're not thinking spiritually, 
then the honest truth is that we will have a hard time on judgment day. Because when the record book of your life is pulled out and God sees how you've lived your life and he sees that you haven't lived for him but you've just lived your life how you want on this earth, that's not what God had asked for from you. So this morning I have a couple of questions. Have you spiritually been born again? Born again? Have you been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins? Repenting of your sins? Confessing his name? Proclaiming to everyone that he is your Lord and your Savior? Are you here this morning? Are you renewing yourself constantly against the temptation of culture? Are you constantly Going through spiritual renewal. Thirdly, are you introducing physical friends to a spiritual eternity? Those are three questions that I want you to think about this morning. And if you've answered no to any of those questions, I want you to consider a change this morning in your life. To do something different. To be something different. Become a child of God. Or renew your commitment to Christ. Or get out there and start showing people the light of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5 9 says, Whether away from our body or at home, we make it our aim to please Him. Will you please Him this morning as we together stand? As we sing. Marvelous praise the